welcome to the 12th episode of The, the Ultimate, Ultimate Fan Hub Podcast. Podcast Which is made by the fans For the fans So once again, mag- for the, after a long time, ha, makukumpleto kami sa atlo ngayon eh. Finally, no? Okay, so once again, this is John Reyes from Fox Sports Philippines Si Jaka Bandong from Dogout Philippines And Jordan Summer as well from Fox Sports Philippines Hey, well, welcome ha, sa ating tatlo, nakumpleto yeah, rin yeah, tayo <laughs> And this is a very uh, special episode dahil syempre meron na naman tayong special guest Special guest? Oo, okay. special guest of So course. this guy, ako, I've been, I've been reading his columns sa The Philippine Star ilang years na and he's is um I consider him as a mentor because I attended one of his uh, broadcasting workshop ng last May. So guys, without further ado, let's welcome our guest for episode twelve. Yeah, no other than <laughs> Mr. Bill Velasco. Uh, thank you guys for having me. I'm excited to be here. A lot of stuff that uh, we have to cover. Yes, sir. And so I know you're going to I've been we we coming that love. We've been reading your columns sa Philippine Star. Lately, yung columns mo are, are regarding the C games. C games eh. So are any updates or sa C games? I mean, ilang months na lang eh before the start of the ano? Eh? Well, to start with. Magulo pa rin. <laughs> uh, but then, so what's new in Philippine sports? Yes. Uh, it will not be as exciting if nobody's fighting. Uh, I think the, the main, there are many main issues. One is, uh, for those of us who are based in Metro Manila, okay. the, the, the main venue in Clark, Clark okay. is uh, theoretically supposed to be finished by August or September. Okay. Uh, they actually took my suggestion to move the sea games as close to Christmas as possible. Okay. So hopefully the Christmas spirit will wash over people and they won't complain <laughs> as much about any flaws. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a question of uh, the status and the funding of FISCO, you know, the Philippine uh, Sea Games Organizing, Organizing Committee. Yeah. Because uh, the rule of the Sea Games Federation is if you're the head of the National Olympic Committee of the host country, which in this case is uh, Ricky Vargas, you are the de facto head of the Sea Games Federation. Okay. So the question there is, which the opposition in the POC is asking, what does that entail? What powers does he have? What can he do and what can he not do? Uh-huh. Because technically, it's the POC that's still moving. Mm-hmm. You know, FISGOC is was formed with the help of the government. You know, uh, <coughs> former Senator uh, Alan Cayetano was is in charge of that. So. That's the, that's the question. Of course, there's always going to be questions because of the pro- procurement of so much equipment, uh, the manpower, <laughs> the volunteer group being headed by uh, Wesley Gonzalez, um, and what role does each POC official play? So those are the things that, that need to be clarified. Plus, you know, there was a major shakeup in the POC two weeks ago during the uh, monthly General Assembly, and Mr. Vargas removed yeah. people from uh, key committees. Yeah. Uh, the membership committee in particular under Bob Bachman so there's a lot so far and it's becoming very emotional uh-huh. and very personal but the problem is will it affect the athletes or not oh yeah, yeah uh, if you remember the last time we hosted uh, 2005 2005 uh, 14 years ago yeah 14 years ago uh, the first gentleman then Mike Arroyo found funds to send all our athletes to China to train for two months which is why we won the overall championship because they were away from all the distractions you know you're training next to an Olympic gold medalist or a world Uh champion or a world record holder so it really makes you stronger as an athlete and they had everything they needed there so they basically just came home to do the SEA Games Mm -hmm. unfortunately we're not going to have that kind of situation now so let's see how things develop Uh, Sir Bill, there was this article that I saw online and they were uh, we are aiming to get that uh, overall championship again. Do you think it's ambitious? One thing that the uh, host country always always has an advantage in is the selection of sports. Yeah, yeah. For example, uh, obviously there will be our niece. Because the only time it's in the Sea Games is in Arnis, which was the failing of Arnis Philippines. Uh-huh. That's why they got kicked out of the POC a couple of months ago. Uh, so, and they're being replaced now by the group of uh, Senator Mick Zubiri. That's one. Secondly, the scheduling. Two, uh, the home crowd. You know, 
I was just uh, talking to Akiko Thompson a few days ago for another project, and she recalls that in 1991, it was the only time swimming had a crowd because it was here, and she would always compete, and there would be very few Filipinos watching. And I spoke to Felix Barrientos this morning, and since the Rizal Memorial Swimming Pool is next to the tennis court, the two crowds were cheering for each other's athletes. <laughs> you know? So there's that overflow, and we missed the overall championship by one gold medal. So uh, that's the the other main advantage. Uh, of course, we're hoping that the athletes will have enough time to train at the new venues uh-huh. in uh, Clark, and that will give them another advantage. And of course, you know, there's always even the international neutral referees always tend to buy to have a bias towards the the host country because one for fear that they may not be able to go home uh, but kidding aside uh, also because <coughs> that's been the pattern that's you know, established way way before uh, there have been so many instances where we got cheated in other uh, sea games you know, like Malaysia Indonesia Thailand those are the most notorious mm-hmm. when it comes to the Philippines it's very it's very minimal comparatively I mean speaking objectively you know, I've done 12 or 13 SEA Games already so uh, I can tell that you know in the events where there's judging uh, the Philippines is the cleanest that I've seen mm-hmm. um, Sir Bill what are some of the sports na you were very optimistic na you know we'll get the goal sure gold, yan, uh, sure gold uh, or something well obviously basketball there's no way we're gonna lose uh, boxing women's boxing golf Billiards. Billiards, definitely. Uh, bowling. I mean, you know, there, there's so many sports where we're doing so well now. Uh-huh. Uh, and you have to remember, this is the biggest SEA Games in history. 56 sports, 512 events. It's the biggest in history. I don't know how that happened. Mm-hmm. Because they were assuming we would have budget for everything <laughs> when they made all those decisions. You know? So, <clears throat> it would be very exciting. Uh, but, you know, Thailand always performs so well regardless of where the yeah. SEA Games are. Indonesia also does very well. Uh, Malaysia, not so much. So we're looking at you know, Thailand and Indonesia, I think, to be the main challengers. Because in, in 91, it was Indonesia that gave us a hard time. Uh, there are sports that they will concede to us. In basketball. Mm-hmm. Arnis, obviously. Uh, billiards. Some of the martial arts. But, you know, uh, we'll have to see also. Because it always comes down to the actual event. Are your athletes in condition? Mm. Uh, can they avoid injury? And a lot of a lot of other circumstances that you have to look at. Uh, speaking of Sir Bill, no, we, of course we have the national team going on. We are highlighting some of our Filipino athletes. So you you mentioned a while ago that you've been working on this certain project, yeah. the Philippines Euro. Could you tell us more about it and what's what's inside? Well, it's it's still somewhat confidential, but needless to say, it will be a a collectible uh, it will be a very very rare uh, published work that will uh, involve 50 of the greatest athletes in Philippine sports history so of course some of the names will be familiar some of them will not uh, it's been a very interesting project uh, Kinito Henson and I are co-editing this book and uh, it will launch in January so we're in the final stages of uh, of the writing and the uh, photo shoots mm-hmm. uh, our challenge basically is the scheduling of some of these athletes because some of them are still active and they're constantly traveling so, but beyond that uh, it's, it's going to be a very very nice project it's, it's something that you will want to keep you know, and something you can pass on to your kids uh, while we were waiting for you the three of us we were talking about tomorrow kasi is opening of the third conference of the Maharlika Pilipinas okay. Basketball League. I mean, you were part of the old Metro Ball before, di ba? The MB- MBA. So, so be may... careful how, to, how you pronounce it because President Ramos used to pronounce it as Metro Ball. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> the, and the Metro and Ball Basketball huh? Association. Yeah, the yeah. MBA. Uh, can you share, sir, yung mga, ano yung experiences nyo doon sa MBA na, in a way, in a way nakaka-relate kayo doon sa what's happening in the MPBL right now? Well, uh, this is one of the, the, the questions I most often ask uh, when it comes to the PBA every time the PBA has problems okay. attendance goes down or there are other issues uh-huh. and uh, I tell them the main selling point of the MBA 
21 years ago was like I like like I always used to say everybody comes from somewhere okay. so we would have incredible crowds and ratings in places like Davao Cebu you know, in Bacolod there was one time the television ratings in Bacolod were 100% so they've wow. been all, all households ratings yeah. Slashers. In the yeah. Negro Slashers you know? and uh you know, we were having problems with the Met- Metro Manila teams. You know, Manila, San Juan, Pasig, because Metro Manila is a melting pot. So I can live in Metro Manila, but I'm from Batangas, or I'm from Iloilo, I'm from Davao, or Cebu, or Pampanga. So we were having problems with those teams. In fact, there was even a, a brief study on Makati, and we found out that the night, uh, the daytime population of Makati at that time was almost 4 million, at night, it was less than a million because all these office buildings are empty. Mm-hmm. So what was most striking about it is because the, ru- the rules of the league required the team to have half of its players from the region. So you had to be from that part of Mindanao, not mm-hmm. necessarily that province, but at least the region. Right. The league was strict about it. Too. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the other thing which I think changed the landscape of Philippine basketball forever was the league allowed each team to have a maximum of two Phil Am players. Okay. But what people forget is the goal was by the fifth year, there would be no more Phil Ams. Oh, okay. It was basically to transfer their knowledge, technology transfer. So you had uh, reverse, like... reverse the brain drain. Uh-huh. You know, learn everything that they Phil learned Am. playing in America yeah. and use it here. And there were guys who came out like Chris Clay, Jeff Flowers. And um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quote unquote Filipino. Yeah, they, they, they manufactured that. Yeah. Uh, but then Filipino blood. Nakagat na sila ng lamok dito. Kaya medyo kung Filipino na sila. But uh, it was very exciting. Uh-huh. The games were very raw, but you know, uh, it, it the games were always intense. Yeah. And that's where you have the regional rivalries come out. You know. Cebu, Bacolod, and Iguilo didn't particularly like each other. Uh-huh. You know, and they, they generally didn't like the teams from the north. You know, Dava was friendly with everybody. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, and e- even the types of basketball that they played. You know, uh, for example, Cagayan de Oro, they had, a, they had I mean, an, an, a disproportionate amount of shooters. Uh-huh. Because that's, that's their style of play in Cagayan de Oro at the time. In Pampanga, they just run and run and run and run, which is the style of Central and Northern Luzon. Uh-huh. So we were exposed to all of that. We were exposed to the different kinds of people, the various gyms and stadiums. Uh, and we we had a lot of fun because we traveled a lot. You know? It exposed me in particular as a journalist to a lot of other places, a lot of other sports, a lot of different personalities. And looking back, that's what helped me now with this project that we're doing because... We're talking about 50 greatest, and they're not just all from Metro Manila or Luzon. You know, I have a couple of people from Mindanao, from from Baguio, from Cebu, you know, and uh, it made me more aware of our diversity in history in sports. Um, when you talk about, for example, Ed Folayan, uh, he's uh, one of the pioneers in mixed martial arts. He's from Baguio, or Benguet. In the 90s, Baguio, uh, natives of Baguio were about half of the Philippine judo team. Okay. So that could have been a contributing factor. Uh, Dumaguete, for example, has always had a lot of archers, probably from Siliman University. So there are you know, particular sports and events and, you know, that are also uh, strongest in certain areas in the Philippines. So those are a lot of things. We made a lot of lifelong friends there. We had a lot of fun. Uh, I will never forget a lot of the conversations we would have on the va- in the vans, on the planes, in the buses, you know, the early morning flights. Uh, Butch Maniego and Bob Novales yeah. uh, would would have endless conversations about all the most useless information. You know? <laughs> they, they, there was one trip we we drove to Laguna. It was a four hour drive, and they, the whole trip they were talking about two things: uh, music. And uh, bold stars from the 1960s onwards. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was it was fun. It's very colorful. Uh, we experienced so many different things, and and I think traveling this country is something that people should do more often. There is so much. Of course, there's a lot so of, much to see. Yeah. There's a lot of politics. Also, there's a lot of you know generational uh, uh, 
differences. I mean, even in Cebu, I once did a basketball tournament. I once held a basketball tournament in Mandawe, and there are people from the neighboring cities who didn't who didn't participate for some reason. You know, stuff like that. Um, and it's so nice to to see that happening again in the MPBL. But they have to be concerned about the old problems we also had in the NBA: poaching of players, uh, who's following the salary cap. How do you how do you police the players? Are they the same? You know, yeah, that, eh? yeah, it's it's similar. Uh, same problems as before. Same problems as before, but the difference is in the MPBL, since they don't play as often, they allow the players to play outside. Yeah. Some of them play in the D League or in other mm-hmm. leagues, and you know you're paying these guys monthly, and they only get to play to play twice a month. So it, it might not be uh, as uh, economically viable as they want it to be. My suggestion was they divide them because the southern teams didn't get home games because of the travel yeah. cost uh-huh. so why don't you have the games in the south uh-huh. and use the savings to have your own broadcast team there because when we did the NBA ABS CBN bought two vans two OB vans one traveled with us everywhere in the south one was in the north so we never and then we would do a, okay. a one game in the north one game in the south yes, we did the opening that way Unlike in the MPBL now, they host the four teams in one city. Eh? Yeah. yeah. Unlike say you said MBA, first game itong town na to. Yeah. 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 We would uh, we would do like a oh my god like a Dava Butuan uh, backbreaking uh-huh. land travel, or we do a Pampanga Pangasinan. Uh, it was uh, it was tiring, but you know we were much younger then, mm-hmm. and uh, you know made a lot of friends. You know, that even up to now we we still. We still communicate with each other. We still you know, keep in touch. I, I still you know, uh, hear from Danny Francisco every so often. Uh, Pia Gonzalez is living in London. Uh, you know, we are, we, we've all gone our separate ways, but we still keep in still touch. Still connected. Because those are, those are really indelible memories. And my dream is to build a team like that. My dream is to teach and to pass on the knowledge you know, that, that I've had over... 33 years and, uh, and we're hoping that the MPBL learns its lessons from the MPBL mm-hmm. because they're they're in a critical <coughs> point in time yeah. they could spend themselves into the ground or they could reformat and fix it so that they don't have the same problems that MBA had now that you've mentioned about the salary cap um, oh you know, <laughs> did I? did I? <laughs> Mon Fernandez uh, parang suggested that one then eh Okay. Uh, and PBL has to have a salary cap. And I think they do on paper. At least like 300,000 a month or something. A minimum of 15,000 and maximum of 50. 50. Yeah. For, 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 oh, that's not going to happen. Uh, um, I don't think some of those players who are now in the PBA were earning that little. Uh, <coughs> secondly, and I've, I've been telling this to some of the PBA team owners. Uh, what's to stop me as a team owner from saying, okay, your salary is one peso a month, but I'm giving you a housing loan, transportation uh, allowance no, 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 no. of 300000 a month. No. Sure. What's going to stop me from doing that? Uh-huh. Because you're calling it something else. Now, if we were in the U.S., they would be very strict about Whatever it's called, it's still considered income for the player. Yeah, yeah. And it comes from the same source. Uh-huh. Okay. So that's that's the gray area that they have to iron out. Uh-huh. Or else the rich teams will just keep getting stronger and the poorer teams will fall out. Uh-huh. The other thing uh, is politicians own some of these teams. Yes. What if they're no longer in office? Or what if they just don't feel like it anymore? You have to have a minimum. If you join the PBA, I think there's a minimum of, I don't know, it's three or five years that uh-huh. you have to stay in the league. Uh-huh. So, those are the things that they have to address for the stability and the permanence of the league. And you have to be fair to everybody. Okay, if I'm if I'm a team in Jensen, half of my game should be in Jensen. You were just given any, one game? Any? One, one, one home, home game. game. Oh. So, how do you fix that? Simple. You rent. A house for all the visiting teams, and then everybody chips in. Panggawa kayo ng athletes village, or a dormitory for uh, for the visiting teams. So it's fair to everybody because you know the 
fairness is predicated on the conditions all being the same. Yeah. So those are the things that they have to address. Because now everybody's happy because it's still the honeymoon stage. Okay. No. Uh, but what happens if? No, we've been at this for six, seven conferences, and we're always in the bottom because we don't have any home games. Or all the teams from Metro Manila get all the best players because the players want to live in Metro Manila. Uh-huh. It's like the NBA. Why is the West stronger? Nobody's talking about the fact that the weather is better in the West. Right? Even if you're offered... A, I mean, all things being equal, players would rather play where it's warm. Optimal condition. Than where it's no. cold. Yeah. You know? Uh, if I were an NBA player, I wouldn't want to play in Minnesota. Or... Well, before in Seattle, Milwaukee, you know, because it's really cold. Uh, yeah. you know? And uh, in fact, you know, I've been to Seattle. There are very, very few Filipinos there, precisely because it's cold. You know? uh, luckily, places like New York, they're, they're entry points for immigrants from Eastern Europe, and you know, so it attracts ad- other nationalities also. But in the Philippines, you have to you have to address that situation. That it be fair to everybody. Everybody gets. Uh, gets a fair shake. So have you been like catching up with the PBA lately? You know, have you been watching PBA? Like what's your take so far in, in this year's season? In this season? <clears throat> well, you know, the past few years, we've had some great athletes among the imports, but we don't have the same personalities, the, the same sp- spectacularly gifted players like they did in the 80s and 90s. I'm sorry, maybe I'm an old fart, but, you know, that it's that's my take on it. Uh, what was compelling about the PBA in the 70s, 80s, and even up to the early 90s was the personalities of the players. I'm not talking clothesline somebody like Alvin Abueva did. I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about you know, maybe some of the trash talk. And, and Commissioner Mas- uh, Marshall has done a great job of allowing the players to play. Yeah. Because for the longest time, the PBA was changing the rules to favor the offensive player. Uh-huh. So now they're letting the they're letting the players play, you know, not to the extreme of the no harm no foul days, uh-huh. but you know it's more physical, and that's the Filipino style of play. Yung tinatawag nating larong kalye, ganon dapat. Dahil dito tayo sa Pilipinas But let's face it, uh, <coughs> the PBA also needs to succeed at the national team level. That buys a lot of goodwill. Uh-huh. People love a winner. Uh, so, now we're doing so well internationally already. You know, then you have you know, y- young people like Kai Soto, AJ Edu, all those really tall guys coming in. So, uh, In fact, I was <coughs> chatting with uh, John Ordonio a couple of weeks ago and he has two sons who are incredibly gifted players. One is 6'1", the other 6'4". They both play guard. Uh, one's entering college, the other's still in high school, and they're, they're going to be teammates again. So, he's, he's offering them to the national team. Mm-hmm. So, this, we have much more material to work with. Mm-hmm. So, that makes it exciting for me. Uh, I don't know if you guys were aware yet, but you know, back in the early 2000s, when I was doing the basketball show, the national team of Angola came here. And they didn't have any seven-footers. They only had two players who had studied in the U.S. But they made it as high as number 11 in the world. And they even qualified for the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they were all, all skinny and athletic and they just run you into the ground. See, that was their style of playing. And it was great until they got to the Olympics where everybody weighs you know, 75 pounds more and, and knocks you to the ground if you try to drive to the basket. So we are on the right track. Okay? It's just a matter of the consistency. And uh, like I said, you can no longer disconnect the PBA from the national team. You can't. So the PBA has to succeed also at the national team level. They've done everything already and they're not getting enough credit for it, I think. Um, which they should. Which they should. Uh-huh. Um, so so I really hope they do well. I mean, we just make it into the, into the Olympics, I will be very happy. Um, I was seven years old the last time we played in the Olympics. That was 47 years ago. So I'm looking forward to that. But for the PBA to succeed, it has to develop more per- more personalities. Uh, it has to <coughs> have more compelling rivalries. Uh-huh. It has to hit a new audience. Uh, there's too much competition now. You can binge watch on Netflix and miss a PBA game. 
You know, you, you go on social media and then the game's half over. You know, so, the PBA is dealing with that. These are conditions that did not exist before. So, that is something that the PBA has to address. It, it will no longer be the juggernaut that it was. 1989, it rated a 32 for the year. You know, that was, and I was working with ABS-CBN. They were worried. I mean, TV Patrol is undisputed number one, but in 1989, they suddenly were worried. So, you know, the PBA has to find a way to attract a younger audience, uh, build more rivalries, create more personalities, tap newer audiences. They're doing a lot of the right things. But also, some of the, some of the tournaments are just long. <laughs> so, maybe a cup, have, have a couple more foreign guest teams like they used to. No, the old uh, Nicholas Studley. Nicholas Studley. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all those. Adidas, yeah. yeah. You know, why not? Uh, As, you know, maybe bring Australia. I don't know. <laughs> but the but the key grit, key with then. Australia. <laughs> no, I think they're going to have a friendly. Yeah, they are. With the, the national yeah, team. Yeah. So oh, 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 oh. I mean, they're all professionals, so yeah. they, should, they should patch things up. It's embarrassing. Okay, so first part, first part pa lang yun, ha? First part pa lang yan. Ang dami na nating na, napulat na story from Sir Bill Velasco. So, uh, that wraps up the first part of our podcast, of our episode 12. When we come back, we have more of Sir Bill Velasco. Uh, we'll be back in a short while. Hi guys, and we're back to the second part of episode 12 of... The, the Ultimate, Ultimate Fan Hub Podcast! It is made by the fans for, for the, the fans. fans! So, gaya nga ang sabi namin nung first part, we are joined by Sir Bill Velasco in our episode. Pero, before we proceed with the uh, meaty second part of our <laughs> podcast, syempre, unahin natin ang ating shout-out! Yo, yes. shout-out! Sir Bill, baka yes. gusto kayong batiin, shout-outs po. Uh, wala. Wala. <laughs> <laughs> Mahirap na. <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> no, I just wanted to greet everybody who's listening and yes. uh, I hope you guys uh, keep on listening. I hope your audience grows because uh, we need more of this. We need more of you younger people getting into the craft, learning it, developing the skills and uh, contributing. Thank you, sir. Yun lang. How about you, Coach Jordan? Any shoutouts? Oh, um, yeah, as usual. Um, of course, to our listeners, good evening and thank you for continuously supporting. Um, pati na rin sa, yan, sa parents ko, sa sisters ko, sa girlfriend ko na rin. What? And to our friends, you know, once, and yun nga, para sa mga players na maglalaro tomorrow sa FPBL. Oh, good luck. Buhay. So, good luck. And pati na rin sa national team na pusbusang nagka-practice. Batang Gilas in particular. So, good luck everybody. So, good, good luck everybody. And of course, to all our, of our Filipino athletes. Um, salute to everyone. Yes. <laughs> yun nga. Just what Cisha mentioned. Salute. Sa, saludo kami sa inyo lahat. How about you? May oh, Cisha ka long? First and foremost, I would like to greet everybody and advance happy Independence Day Ay, sa ating lahat na Pilipino in just, ano, in just a few hours from now it's Independence Day, Independence Day. Um, speaking of which yun nga nauna na si Jordan saludo kami sa lahat ng atletang Pilipino na taas noong pinam, uh, minamagayway ang bandera ng Pilipinas yes. sa international scene at nahirapan ako magsabi doon <laughs> Um, also, I'd like to say hi to my batchmate from Letran, si Direct Mark Norelia. Na nakita ko lang kanina. Meron kaming project na collab kaninang umaga. And if you guys have time, sorry pa promote ko na. Catch me on real time on Saturday. <laughs> Resource person. <laughs> Wala pong makonek-konek sa sports or sa kahit anong trabaho ko. Basta panoorin niyo po ako sa real time on Saturday, 9.15pm on GMA News TV. Also, good luck to the Pasay Voyagers and all the teams in MPBL tomorrow. And sa ating mga colleagues in sports writing. Yes. Yun. Yeah. Okay, ako, I want, syempre, I want to greet my wife and my two kids, then mga publications that we support, that we write for, Fox Sports Philippines, uh, syempre, Dugout PH, then uh, Kings of the Court, uh, ah, syempre, I want to greet pala my friends from ano, uh, Ilorde Ortigas, then syempre, yung mga naging classmates ko sa, dun sa the first ever Bill Velasco Broadcasting and Yon, Marketing, which we will na. talk about <laughs> later. Saking so, syempre, lagi kong binabate, di ba? 
all the Filipino sports fans. Kasi yes. we did this passion project uh, for you guys. Kasi yes. when we started in November, kaya talaga, we, had, we had those guys in mind. Kasi kami, we started uh, sports fans, then we ventured into, you know, as, as writers, as stuff like that. So, yun, this is for you guys. Yep. So, yun, ang shoutouts ay natapos din. <laughs> so, we're back with our guest. Sir, medyo may kli yung shoutouts namin, no? Yun. So, nabanggit niya sir kanina, at nasabi ko rin yung broadcasting workshop, di ba? After three decades of being a broadcaster on TV, radio, why did you decide to come up with that workshop? It's something I really wanted to do for a very long time. Okay. Uh, but they say, you know, starting is half the job. So, uh-huh. I would always uh, make reasons and then I'll schedule it at a later date until I finally said, there, na, I think now is the time. Uh, okay. One, my, my good friend and compare Noel Zarate, had been doing it for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I introduced uh, Noel to sports broadcasting over 20 years ago. And he's done so much. He's contributed so much to the craft. Mm-hmm. Um, he's bred a whole new generation of uh, sports broadcasters, which I've always wanted to do. But I was doing it in small groups. Uh, whenever I'd have a an independent production I would bring together people and hope that they would stay in the industry mm-hmm. so I said <coughs> the last nine years or so I've been doing corporate trainings with my best friend's company Manila Exicon Group and that helped me develop a technique for teaching there's some modules there that you know like we have a module called storytelling in business which I'm the only one who does uh, so I, I do that for multinational corporations and I said it's time we did something public it was a gamble because you don't know uh, if you'll make money or lose money. Our venue was the uh, Development Academy of the Philippines. It's not a cheap venue. Uh, and I, I create my own customized content also. So that's one advantage I have. I do team buildings for other uh, clients. I can create content. So that set, having, you know, having said that, I wanted to pass that on. I wanted to teach. I wanted to correct a lot of the mistakes like the welcome back. <laughs> you know, that's the number one mistake that broadcasters around the world make. And I and those are the things that I teach. I teach the histories of certain sports. I teach because this is the foundation of your knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> I used to handle the training for all the NCAA courtside reporters of ABS CBN. So I was yeah. present in one of your seminars. Oh my god. A decade really, ago. Yeah. So <laughs> And, and I would ask people, why do you want to do this job? And one guy said, I think I can do this job because I have a nice, now, nice voice. So I shouted at him and threw him out. And then and then the you know the, uh, and then this guy who was pretending to know about basketball, I asked just asked him basic questions he couldn't even answer me. Uh-huh. So I said, if you don't even respect our profession enough to know the basics, then you shouldn't be here because you're not taking me seriously uh, I, I sometimes tell the story about uh, Coach Joel Banal we did an NBA game in Cebu and two things happened after the game he slumped back in his chair exhausted and I said coach what's the matter he, says, he said I don't know what's more tiring doing this or coaching and we had and our rooms in the hotel were next to each other I could hear him pacing at 1.30 in the morning he couldn't sleep he was so wired I said, these are the things that people don't think about. How much work goes into preparation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, the, in the workshop, I talked about in all the years that I've been interviewed by other people, I've only experienced a pre-interview once. Uh, Martin After Dark. Uh, Martin Rivera, as a writer, sat down with me for an hour before the show. So when Martin uh, talked to me, we were already communicating at a deeper level. It's not the showbiz... It's, it's already, you know, we're talking about ideas, experiences, and things that people really want to find out about. We're not just filling up the air. So, you know, that's why I wanted to do this. And I think there's a whole generation of people who should hear this. I'm uh, hoping to, we, we've gotten inquiries from a school in uh, Makolod, uh, an event organizer in Pangasinan, and you know, I said, well, we can try to lower our costs. If you can get us the venue for free, we'll increase the size of the class, make it cheaper for the students, just to be able to do this in other places. You know, balance uh, the power, so to speak. So it's only the people in Metro Manila who get this kind of training. You know, 
It's the same thing in, in sports. What do the teams in Cebu complain about? The level of competition in Manila. So, those are the reasons why I wanted to do it. Pay it, pay it forward. Uh-huh. You know, uh, I'm very happy that you know I've introduced certain people to sports broadcasting. You know, Ed Tolentino, uh, Boy at Season. I mean, I tease Boy at a lot, but you know, I'm I'm proud of how he's developed. I mean, he's got a DZMM show. I I've never had a show on DZMM. Uh, and then Noel, of course, you know, who sadly quit music to concentrate on sports casting and he was already a famous awardee so you know all the people I've also helped along the way I, I always used to say this at Noel's workshops look at the person to your left and look at the person to your right only one of you will probably end up in this profession you know because there may not be room it may not be for you the producers might not like you or you might do some other things like writing producing directing uh, so we have to be very real about it or, luckily for you guys, the technology exists that you can do it yourself uh, and uh, learn along the way. So, that's I've always wanted to teach. Uh, Seb Sarmenta was my college professor. Uh, he had just started teaching a couple of years before. And I've always wanted to teach also. Uh, but the, con- the consistency of the schedule was going to be my problem. Because, as you know, we work on weekends... So I can, can't even have like a weekly class on Saturday. Uh, so, and you know, I had two sons I was putting through college. They graduated five years ago. And I'm taking care of my, my daughter who's six years old. So I had to factor those things in. So I, I was thinking maybe a workshop would be a good start. And we can do something later on. Maybe, a, well, we'll do batch two, September 14 and 15. So those who want to sign up, you know, we can do so. And then... <laughs> Uh, we can, I want to do an advanced one I want to do one just for radio there's so many uh, video production I mean I've done documentaries for Nat Geo uh, the PBA documentary will be carried by you know, Discovery Channel Asia Pacific so uh, there are opportunities there and it's, it's much easier now because equipment is relatively inexpensive and uh, the knowledge is on the internet so you just have to really know what you want to do and what you're looking for. That's why I'm hoping that the workshops will point people in the right direction. Uh-huh. All right, let's move. Uh, let's rewind back. How did you start it in sports broadcasting? Wow. <clears throat> How much time do we have left? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, when God rewind. was in short pants. Uh, <laughs> no, I I was very sickly as a child. I had. Uh, <laughs> asthma, scoliosis, migraines, and flat feet. So sports literally saved my life. I swam every day for two years in a public pool to get rid of my asthma. I had to do very painful calisthenics to straighten out two curves in my spine. And because I was flat-footed, I indulged in a lot of running sports because I couldn't stand around for a long time. And being healthy overall eliminated the migraines. So I wanted to give back. Uh, I had to stop playing basketball. I had tried out and I'd made it to the Ateneo Blue Eagles but at that time there was no dual citizenship and I needed to retain my uh, US citizenship because I was searching for my biological father so I gave up basketball because the next step would have been the, the national team level. and I would have had to give up my US citizenship uh, so when we graduated uh, a month after the EDSA revolution that's how long ago it was uh, ABS even reopened and I auditioned, or rather I applied, uh, and they said, you know, they had newscasters and reporters already, can you do sports? So that's how I started. And I was pitching sports stories even while I was covering the Senate, Congress, Malacanang, military. You know, I even set a record at the time. I submitted nine stories in one day, and seven of them aired on TV Patrol in one day. And that was the and the following day I transferred full time to the sports department. And the sports department at the time of ABS Seven was four people. Frank Evangelista, myself, Alan Howe, and one cameraman on the late uh, Ray Chodoro. So I was finding stories. Palarupamasa was in Quezon. I would drive there, bring my cameraman there. We would shoot, drive all the way back just in time for TV control. Uh, I was doing that on top of my other duties. As, uh, I, would do the, I was doing the morning show. I was doing field reporting. Uh, 
I, I pushed for the first ever sports show of ABS-CBN. It was called Sports Week, which later became Masters of the Games. Uh, I was doing the sports for the morning shows. I would occasionally contribute to DZMM. Um, then things started to, to fall into place. Uh, in 1990, uh, I got married, and I asked my bosses if I could do work outside because you know, I needed to save up for my children. And they allowed me, not knowing that I, were gonna, I was going to do PBA, because Sev invited me to join the broadcast panel. Sev Vintage Enterprises, right? Yes, it was Vintage Enterprises. And seeing me on the air, the year after uh, PBA had this record high, highest ratings, they decided to make me choose. So I chose PBA. And after that, you know, I was there for uh, from 1990 until the end of uh, 92. And after that, I started doing independent stuff, started directing. I directed a, a public affairs show called Action 9, did boxing, uh, produced some stuff on my own already, did PABL, C Games, uh, and then just kept growing from there. But you have to remember, this was the time when there was no sports on television. There was, it was not something you could feed your family with so I was I just kept on doing it in the hope that eventually it would become something that people could do full time and uh, eventually it did and the, 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 the best thing about it is a lot of your learning was hands on you know, we were allowed to handle equipment we were allowed to pretty much do whatever we wanted see what would work and what wouldn't work and I think now that hamstrings a lot of young people Sometimes going in, they think, oh, that would never work. So they don't try it. And I also had a lot of... My, my, my thing is always, if somebody says it's never been done before, I find a way to be the first to do it. Um, when I was in charge of the PBA TV coverage, we, would only get, we were only getting slow-mos from two cameras. I talked to one of the technicians. We created a small switcher. We patched it into the, the main board. And all of a sudden, we were getting slow-mos from all the cameras. You know, uh, stuff like that. I was the first one to do post-game highlights. You know? As the credits are rolling, there are highlights of the, of the, the game. Maybe blink pa nun eh. Replay, replay. Yeah, so <laughs> other, other stuff. You know, a lot of other stuff. I took a cameraman to the ceiling of Ultra no way. to get an overhead shot. So mm -hmm. Ginebra Pure Foods Championship game. Because the center of the court was the logo of the PBA. It had never been done before. Uh, for the 91 C Games, <coughs> I placed cameras in places where they had never been put before. Uh, I did a stand upper on top of Isitan overlooking Araneta Coliseum. These are things that people had never thought of doing. Uh, I covered a lot of different sports. I introduced people to a lot of athletes. And I, I provided my own insights. I just had to make sure that what I would, what I would say would make sense to people. Para hindi naman nino. Sabihin lang yun. Hindi naman kapanipaniwala yung sinasabi mo. Diba? So, and then it just grew from there. Pretty soon, you find yourself being able to move laterally. 2006, I decided to independently, independently produce the basketball show, which to this day has never been replicated. Uh -huh. We did that for six and a half years. I could walk into any basketball game in the country, shoot my own footage, and walk out with it and own the rights to it. I was doing my own highlight reels. I was doing my own MTVs. I was doing my own features. That slam book segment, I started that. You know, until, and then I, was, I started organizing events. I did the first uh, nationwide three-on-three -three basketball tournament in the Philippines in 1996. They did the streetball challenge. I also did the last one in 2005, the Asian streetball challenge. I did the first NBA three-on-three -three in Southeast Asia. 2011, Horace Grant and the Knicks dancers came over. I organized Arnis tournaments, press conferences. I did two Arnis World Championships here in the Philippines. So it just, if you love what you're doing, you're going to find ways to keep doing it. Uh -huh. you know? And this was before people were you know, labeling themselves event organizers, independent producers, and all of that. So I've tried everything and I've made all the mistakes. So. <laughs> so when, when somebody tries something and they say it won't work, I say, no, no, I, I've, I've tried that. It'll work. Trust yourself. So that's, that's, 
the, the short version of you know, how I how I've had a career in sports. Nice. Short na pala yun. Short na yun. Kaya pala tinanong ni sir how much time yeah. Yeah. Ang kulang ko na lang uh, eh, ang kulang ko na lang Asian Games. I've oh. never done the Asian Games. Sir, so, given your wide experience in doing all of this, these things na sir, what are some of the yung mga memorable coverages and events that you've had in your you know, oh wow uh, your 30 hmm. plus years hmm well the PBA was always a lot of fun uh, being around all those greats and, and developing friendships and relationships with them uh, when, when when Robert Jaworski tells your camera crew that you know, si Bill lang ang nakapasok sa bahay ko uh, even though you rarely see each other or uh, you know you want to interview somebody and he say I'll only do it because it's you you know that that, that for me is, is the big the big thrill um, interviewing you know, NBA players uh, the, the greatest I mean breathing the air that the air of greatness you know? that's why I really wanted to do the Olympics just to experience it you, I mean, you're among 10, 12,000 of the greatest athletes in the world, the best broadcasters in the world, uh-huh. the most famous journalists. I mean, the air is different. Uh-huh. You cannot allow yourself to be less. Uh, oh, my first radio show was a trip because Tolentino and I got to talk about everything and anything we wanted. Uh, I created the first stepladder professional boxing tournament in the Philippines, probably in the world, uh, Knockout. That's uh-huh. the first... TV uh, broadcast that Ed Tolentino and I did together back in 1998. It was pre-programming for the NBA. Um, yeah. Uh, we had five weight divisions and then we would get boxers from NCR Luzon besides in Mindanao. And so you had to win your division in each area. Then we'd have a northern and a southern championship and then the winners would fight each other. And we would take three or four episodes at a time because you can't have the boxers fighting every week. Somebody would have died. Um, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. <coughs> so many firsts. Uh, I've been the first to write about so many different sports. The first to talk about so many different athletes. Uh, from uh, Luz McClinton's winning the fame World Bodybuilding Championship the same day that Pacquiao beat Margarito. That's why nobody wrote about it. I um, wrote about Cheryl Nakanishi becoming the first Filipina to win the Mr. and Ms. Universe overall title in 2017. You know, I, I, a lot of that stuff. Um, I was the first journalist. To, when I went to the U.S. in 2007, I was sent there by the PSC to cover the World Boxing Championships. That's when Harry Tanya Moore qualified for Beijing. And I exposed a lot of the stuff that was going on with the ABAP at the time. Uh, but then, I said, I'm already here. I might as well do other stuff. I got the first ever... Philippine interview with David Diaz. This was before he, when he was still challenging Manny Pacquiao. Uh-huh. Uh, then I, we drove from Chicago to Bowling Green, Kentucky. You know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the armpit of the white world uh, to get the only video of Japet Aguilar playing for Western Kentucky, the Hilltoppers, with the first round draft, NBA draft pick named Courtney Lee. Who, by the way, attacked me on Twitter because I said he was a ball hog and he was <laughs> um, yeah well he was, he was in like five different teams in four years Dallas. he blew he blew the NBA finals he blew two games in the finals for Orlando could have passed the ball to Dwight Howard underneath you know? so Kobe Bryant saying thank you to him um, and then that trip I went I also interviewed Francis Arnais. I got the first video of Eugene Tejada walking again after being paralyzed. Uh, so much, so much. So much. I, I filed eight stories in 12 days from all over the U.S. Seven of them aired in TV Patrol while I was still in the U.S. So things like that, just to prove that it can be done. You know? uh, I did a feature on this Filipino named uh, Jojo Stegens who was a U.S national taekwondo champion who's a police detective in Chicago uh, you know stuff like that it's it's just seeking out the stories I did the first ever documentary on the history of the PBA 
basta hindi pa nagagawa gusto kong ako mauna ginawa na ni Bill Velasco yeah. <laughs> pag nagawa na ni Bill Velasco I wrote about I'm the first one to write about the Philippine bobsled team okay which competed in Austria January <laughs> January of last year yeah I got them the recognition from the PSC so they could compete for free in Vienna okay. then they moved to Canada because more people speak English in Canada and they're more Filipinos there um dami you know? And I get invited and uh, I get offered projects because people know what my intentions are. And my intention is really, I'm there for you guys. I'm not there for me. You know, I don't even appear in, on camera in a lot of the stuff I do. You know, so, and then I, you know, the, the, the latest thing is I'm doing a couple of films on some of our national athletes and teams. Like our 1936 Olympic basketball team. Uh, the first Filipino boxers who became world champion you know, so, or, or international champion. So those are the things I want to do. I want to keep growing, reinventing myself. I, I, people ask me, why don't you cover the games anymore? Well, you know, if I get offered, I'm, I'll do it. But it no longer provides a thrill for me. You know, I, want you, I want the younger guys to do it. Let them get their feet wet. Let them experience it. You know, if I get offered to do radio, I will probably do radio because I didn't do it as much as I wanted to. So, I'm at that space now where, what else can I do? What else can I contribute? What new ground can I break? Uh, there's a saying from Moneyball, uh, when Billy Bean is uh, played by uh, Brad Pitt, is told, you know, uh, the first guy through the, I know you're getting kicked in the teeth right now, but the first guy through the wall, he always gets bloody. So that's me. I'm the guy who breaks down the wall. And I don't mind getting bloody. I, I, I don't mince words, I don't BS people, uh, and it's gotten me into trouble, it's, it's a, a lot of people go around, go behind my back and criticize me or try to sabotage my career because I'm frank and I'm honest, and, but that's me, and that's, that's what I bring to the table. You want somebody to, to kiss your butt, that's not me. You know, I'll tell you what's wrong, I'll tell you... When the PBA rating started going down in 91 and 92, until it hit single digits, from a high of 32 in 1989, went single digits by the middle of 1992. It was partly because they randomized the schedule, and that included the two new teams, Pepsi and Pop Cola. Plus, it was so hard to get to Ultra then. So why would I bother going to Ultra for a second game that features two new teams, or one of them is going to get massacred anyway, and it's so hard to go there, and... You know, and I told and I told us that well, you know, we can't make the, the PBA rate higher because it is not a relationship of equals. We're the gift wrapping. The TV broadcast does not make the games better. We can emphasize the good things about the game, but we don't create the games, and they couldn't accept it. So I, I said, but that's a fact. So you know, that's just me. I don't. I don't. Uh, want to waste your time by you know, giving you false hopes on something or the wrong idea about something this is what it is uh, you can get mad at me but then you'll be shooting the messenger you know, so, so having worked with PBA and you know, so Vintage then MBA yeah. how, how has uh, sports broadcasting pati yung courtside reporting how has it progressed to any observation for your current state ng okay. broadcasting this yeah. is the fundamental problem in sports broadcasting it is not taught in schools okay. uh, <clears throat> Oregon University has various sports courses they have their own you know in-house TV station in the school okay. uh, managing a coliseum is a two-year course UC Berkeley has uh, team psychology all these other, none of that is in the Philippines. Sports journalism is, is an elective in UP. And of course, you have all those courses in other schools which is just for the athletes to have something to start with. So, ipapasa lang sila ng teacher. Basta masabing, enrolled ako eh. Diba? Uh, which might not serve them in later in life. And we know what schools we're talking about. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's the whole issue that I, I, I want to I wanna address. It. It's not taught in school, so where do you learn it? That's why people think they can just walk into the job and do it. Yeah. You know, so unless you really study, 
you read, you observe, you do some of the things I tell you to do in the workshop, you'll, you'll be mediocre. Uh, and, there, and some of these people who are working broadcasters have told me themselves, I, I only really know basketball, but they're giving me this job to talk about all the different sports every day. So, what will I do? Tell him not to take the job? Yeah. That is why you have extremes. You have very, very talented you know, sports broadcasters. You have the Seb Sarmentas, Andy House, Charlie Kuna, Boom Gonzalez, Nico Halili. And, and then you have those who have never gotten better. Money steals her. Because if it, it's not like in the U.S. where you train in college, you work for a small town, you work for a big city, you work for a regional network. By the time you're a national courtside reporter in the NBA, you're at least 38, 40 years old. You know? By the time you're doing the evening news, you're 45, 50 years old. Here, our premium is youth. But youth brings with it a lot of inexperience. They don't know how to find their light, so they're talking, there's a shadow over their face. Uh, they always say, sabi ni coach, sabi ni coach, which is ridiculous, which means they're not processing the information or they talk too much. Uh, there has to be a mechanism to train people. Now, it might work now because there are some people who can do it full-time already. They're getting enough work to do it full-time and they're independent broadcasters. But again, it's the producer's prerogative. The producer is owned, is owned by the network. So the network doesn't see the value in getting any better. That's the main problem. Of course, we all know you as the Bill Velasco, oh the sports God. analyst. Yeah. But you're a family man. How do you juggle between the family and the things that you do? Well, uh, well my two sons were also in sports. Uh, they played... Uh, for Benedictine International School. Uh, they played for Team B of Ateneo for three years. It just so happened that's when Ateneo started winning five in a row. Uh, and there, you know, like my older son, Vince Velasco, works with ABS-CBN Sports. He does this segment called Vince Ventures where he's trying out new sports, new gyms in different places. He teaches uh, fitness and boxing in a flyweight gym in BGC. My younger son just finished his master's in... Uh, Melbourne, all is on his own, so I'm good. I couldn't be prouder. I can't take really any credit because they did all the work. But when they were kids, I said, you have to have a sport. I don't care what sport it is. It has to be a sport wherein you will sweat and you will learn the value of hard work. So we tried a lot of different sports, and eventually they settled on basketball. I was, very, I was pretty happy. When they gave it up, I felt sad, but that's... That's not their dream. I cannot impose my dream on them. Okay? And then now I have a six-year-old daughter who loves swimming. Even though there's no career in swimming, I, you know, no professional league in swimming, I, you have to feed their dreams. Maybe later on she'll try something else. I don't know if she... But her pediatrician says she'll be tall, so I don't know if we should get her into volleyball or golf or basketball. Let's see. But then again... You just have to open the doors for them and see which doors they will walk through. You can't. That's the problem of a lot of parents, you know. I'm a doctor. You should be a doctor, you know. Or, or you know, I'm, I'm. You should follow the fam, Enter the family business. You should take over. Look at all the great athletes. Very few of them have children who follow their footsteps, and often the children are not as successful. Those who do. So. So for me, it's, this is your dream. Whatever will help you with your dream, I will support. You know, because I can't impose my dream on you. Right? My, my son, Vince, at his age, is a far better writer than I was. My son, Daniel, is much more intelligent when it comes to business. And, you know, of course, they saw me make all the mistakes. And sometimes they would suffer for my mistakes. But I also introduced them to broadcasting when I was doing the basketball show. You know, I, I think... That was 2006, so Vincent must have been what, 14, 15. Daniel was, was a year and a half younger. So. so they got. I exposed them to everything. I would bring them with me to coverages. And it's for you to choose. But these are your options. 
if you get into sports broadcasting, I can help you. But they've they haven't needed my help. So that's 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 it. And and when they get grown up, I basically talk to them about. I'm very simple. Okay. Um, if you want to go out with your friends, I'd rather you bring your friends to the house. Even if I have to go to the grocery every other day, it's I'd rather you be at home. Plus, they're in sports, so they don't go, they don't get drunk, they don't stay out late. They're hanging around people who are over six feet tall, so nobody's gonna mess with them. Kawawa lang yung mga restaurant na angry rice. Obusang obusang kanin sa kanila. Other than that. You know, it's, it's very enjoyable, it's very fulfilling, it's very tiring, and it forces you to improve as a person. So I'm much more mellow now, I'm much more chill now than I was when they were born. Uh, and there are things you cannot protect them from. You know, Vincent once hit his head, jumping up and down on the bed, needed stitches. You know, I was holding him down while the doctor was stitching up his head, and I couldn't take that on for him uh, whenever they've been hospitalized it's, you know, sana ako na lang ako na lang yung tahiin ako na lang yung magkasakit uh, but you can't you can't protect them from that you just can be there for them you know, so you know, I would tell them you know, I, we expose them to all these workshops and seminars to develop them as people and in one workshop I said to, to Daniel I would step in front of a bullet for you I hope you know that you know, and that's it other than that, you cannot curtail their freedom. You cannot stop them from doing things they're going to do anyway. Uh-huh. You know? And when, when they discover sex, then that's another thing you have to prepare them for. <laughs> no, because uh, they're going to do it anyway. So since they're boys, I said, okay, I only have two non-negotiables. One, you never, ever, 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 ever do drugs. And two, don't get anybody pregnant. Because, why? And then I explain. You do drugs, it chemically changes you as a person. So you're no longer the son I raised. So you don't belong in my house. Secondly, you get somebody pregnant, you're prepared to take on the responsibility of having your own family. And that's your responsibility, it's not mine. So I explain it to them. So It it never happened. Because, you know, you think to yourself... I've got it pretty good here, you know. I don't have to worry about anything. There's food on the table. I live near the school. I don't have to worry about anything. So why should I mess that up? And it also taught them to be responsible at a far younger age than I was. So that's that's it. That's basically it as a parent. You know, you have to give them the freedom to make the mistakes and just be there to catch them when they fall. Other than, of course, other than Independence Day tomorrow, magpa Father's Day na rin oh, tayo sa, sa Sunday. So, sir, lastly, no, how do you, syempre, you mentioned, you know, your adventures of being a father, of course. How, paano ba, how, how will you celebrate mo with your kids? And, uh, well, we normally have lunch together because, you know, I respect the fact that you know, my sons are usually very busy, but my other son is in Australia, so he can't be here. You know, uh, so... Actually, last year was the first time that we did not celebrate Father's Day because everybody was just so busy. Uh, and plus, you know, you know, in our line of work, we work on weekends. You know, that's that's our head. I mean, Monday is generally my day off. But so you know, we just keep in touch. I I always make sure that the last thing my my kids hear from me is "I love you." you know, so when we text, when we chat on Messenger. I make sure if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, you know how I feel about you. You know, I'm not the kind. Of, I mean, I hug my best friend in public. I, you know, I, I hug all my closest friends. In, I don't care because for me, what other people say will not feed me, will not protect me, will not save me. You know, uh, I, I a, a female friend of mine taught me the three F rule. You know, which I, I try to avoid saying in polite company, but. If you don't feed me, fund me, or f- me, my life is none of your business. Basically, what it means is, you're not my parents, you're not my boss, uh, I don't owe you anything in terms of business, and you're not in an intimate relationship with me. So you have no say in my life. And that's basically how I've lived my life. You can say whatever you want, you can criticize me, that's your right, that's your freedom. 
but be sure to be responsible for what you say. Uh, if you're going to criticize me, make sure that it's your face and your name that's attached to those words. Because then, you face the consequences of your actions. Because I do. I mean, I can't run. I can't hide from anything. I can't, you know, say, no, I didn't say that. I'm a public figure. So it's, you've got you to man up to it. So if you're going to debate something with me, be prepared to debate. You know. Wow. Oh, overdose. <laughs> overdose. Ah. Kulang, ay, kulang talaga yung time. Eh. <laughs> but wait, one last... Uh, Kamu, meron pa. Meron pa. Sige, sige, sige. Sige. But wait, there's more. Yeah, <laughs> there's more. Sir Bill. Yes. Any message for those budding sports broadcasters? Yes. Ah. Let's take notes. Ah, Let's take notes. Notebook, notebook you know. please. <laughs> okay. Um, the short version is... Find a new way to make things better. You gotta know your stuff. You gotta know your craft. Uh, I use it as, a, as an example. Every time I cover the SEA Games or the Olympics, first thing I do is I go to the, the media center and I get the handbooks and rule books of all the sports. And I study them. So I'll spend like my whole first day doing that. Because uh, you have to know the rules. So, for example, I ask somebody, <coughs> what are the differences between amateur and professional basketball? It should be easy. You'd be surprised how many people don't know. What is a team rebound? Look it up, right? So, you have to know what are the, what are the rules of the games you're talking about because you're supposed to be the expert. And I said this at the workshop. Success is when preparation meets opportunity. If the opportunity comes and you're not prepared, you can't do anything. But if you're already prepared, you're just waiting for the opportunity. Right? So, when I first started, they made me read the sports page. Because they wanted to know if I sounded like a sports broadcaster. But I was prepared. Because I read a lot. I, I, I would buy books of sports production, sports TV coverage. One of my favorites was uh, books was published in 1989. Terry O'Neill was the best sports producer in the U.S. He produced the Olympics, Monday Night Football, ABC's Wide World of Sports. He wrote a book called The Game Behind the Game. So I read that book cover to cover. I had a library of 800 books uh, by, in 1992 when our house burned down. Uh, so I, I read a lot. I buy a lot of stuff. So that's, uh, and then you learn from everybody. I'm learning from stuff from you guys it keeps the energy up and something people ask me <clears throat> so do I watch a lot of basketball <clears throat> do I watch a <clears throat> hundred basketball games no you watch one basketball game a hundred times and that's where you will learn because it passes by you you watch one game it passes by you you don't see the patterns you don't feel the rhythm of the game you don't see what excites the crowd you don't see players' tendencies. And that's what coaches spend a lifetime doing. And try to change the way things are done. I used to insist uh, that our courtside reporters go to practice the day before. Nobody would do it. How would you know if somebody didn't show up for practice, somebody got injured, uh, somebody was late, or somebody was told that the coach is going to bench you? You don't know that. By the time you get to the game, it might be too late. Okay? You have to know more than the other than the average person. Okay. Or else, why do it? Okay. I always, I always say, respect our profession because it is a profession. We may not have the same technical training as we do as you do in other countries like the US, but we have the experience. We have the learning. And we carry, you carry that with you. Anything you learn, nobody can take it back. So use all the opportunities to learn. You know, talk to people. All of us are storytellers. All of us like to share. You know, ang oras nyo kakakwento namin. You know, you get me, Noel, Sev, Boyet. I mean, you get all of us around the table. My gosh. You know, we won't get anything done because all we're going to do is tell stories. You know? And then you see, oh, how, that's how that works. Ah, so ganun pala yun. Also, that's how you prepare. That's how you, you know, 
if you've ever if you ever get the chance to do the Olympics, you're gonna know that you're gonna be talking for at least ten to sixteen hours a day, and you will probably get maybe four hours of sleep a day for at least sixteen days. How do you cope? How do you pace yourself? How do you survive? How do you still sound and look good after two weeks of no sleep? Right? These are the things that nobody else can teach you except us. Because we've been there before. We're the ones who've gone through the wall and gotten bloodied for you. So that's why I, I want to pass it on a bit. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah. Very much. Very much. Yeah. Before we go, we would like to greet Jonas and Servil and the Happy Father. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. And to all the fathers uh, listening to our podcast, Happy Father's Day, thank you. Oh, by the way, uh, speaking of funny, uh, I wanted to greet Coach Eric Samson. Um, he is, they are currently in the country. He is coaching the Thailand women's under-19 team. They are in the country for a series of tune-up games. Okay. Uh, before that, he coached uh, the PNP the, in the UNTV Cup, and they uh, won one tournament and were runner-up in another tournament. Uh, he gets to travel to all these other countries. He coached the, the champion basketball team in the Maldives wow. last December and you know his success has continued to get him work in other countries and these are the things that people don't know that you know, to make a living he has to be an OFW as a basketball coach uh, so he's preparing actually also the national women's team of Thailand for the SEA Games uh, so, you know, you, you'd be surprised at how many Filipinos coach basketball teams in other countries and how many Filipinos actually make a living playing in other countries? Okay. So happy Father's Day, Kay Coach Eric. So you have a very good man. Okay. Happy Father's Day. I'm actually so, seeing him to for lunch tomorrow. Kibati mo na lang kami. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so dami nating natutunan no, from Sir Bill this episode. My pleasure. Uh, uh, so, on behalf of Jordan and Sika, sir, we would like to thank you for giving us your very valuable time na istorbo ko namin no, it's okay. it... <laughs> for this podcast. So, uh, ano, parting shots, si sir. Nabanggit niya yung uh, batch 2, sir, of the workshop. Yep, September 14 and 15 at the Development Academy of the Philippines, the second Bill Velasco broadcasting workshop. It's not just sports. It is the techniques and the history of uh, broadcasting. Okay, yeah. Being a former student, ako... Uh, Dami ko na tutunan dun sa two-day seminar. So, I hope you guys would catch up on batch two. So, with that, ano? That concludes our episode 12. Yeah, of the Ultimate Tan <laughs> Podcast. So, be sure to tune, tune in sa ating future episodes. So, yes. uh, Go follow our YouTube account pala, and our Instagram account. Okay. And so, once again, this is Jonas Reyes from Fox Sports Philippines. Siya ka ba lang of Daga Philippines? And Jordan Summer from Fox Sports Philippines as well. Thank you for your time and Happy good night. Independence Day. Good night. Happy Independence yes. Day. Good night.